Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Cheryl Jennings. Today we have a special roundtable discussion in celebration of Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. ABC 7 News anchor Kristen C. is here with local trailblazers for an in-depth conversation about opportunities and challenges in the Asian American community. Thanks, Cheryl, and thank you for joining us. Asians and Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing group in the U.S. They now make up 16 percent of California's population and 36 percent of San Francisco. That's according to the latest census. We have three amazing guests to talk about some of the issues facing this growing community. Welcome. We have Corey Lee, chef owner of one of San Francisco's premier restaurants, Bennu. Anna Sedana, former PayPal executive and founder and CEO of the One Million Lights Foundation, and the Reverend Norman Fong, executive director of the San Francisco Chinatown Community Development Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Thank I you. mean, you are all role models. And uh, let's springboard into some of the issues we can talk about uh, with a real role model, someone from Palo Alto, the homegrown uh, Asian American who's taken the MBA and really the world by storm. We're talking about Jeremy Lin, of course, right? Did you oh, catch yeah. insanity in Lin's sanity? <laughs> insanity for sure. Yeah, what was my, that like for you in your community? So my, my son really got into it, and a lot of kids in Chinatown was so proud to see the first Asian American there doing it. Right, uh, I mean, there have been other yeah. Asians in the NBA, right? But yes. he's the first American born. Um, how is that significant? It's a big deal because, um, you know, like a Chinatown kid I know of, Norman, who applied for the Warriors, couldn't make it because he was too short, you know? And there's the stereotypes that we all have to overcome. It's like, a, it's like Chief Red Lao, he was too short to be a cop in San Francisco, and then we had to cross that barrier. So for me, I was excited for my son because he went nuts and he's got a jersey. Uh, but also for me, it was like when Bruce Lee came on the movies and TV, it's like that, you know, it was, it was uh, yeah, exhilarating. Yeah, there's certainly pride alive, that, right? You know? And part of it, too, is the fact that he was such a good role model and the fact that he made it to the NBA with good grades, right? Yeah. Palo Alto yeah. High School, Harvard, uh, a lot of the things that parents really emphasize as well. And I, I know, Anna, you know, in the Palo Alto area, uh, that reverberated as well. A lot, yes. Both my kids go to Palo Alto High School, actually. And the entire community was inspired by this. Oh, cool, yeah. yeah. So as a trailblazer, though, you know, there's always the issue of fighting prejudice, right? Uh, in fact, one common tweet I saw a lot was, uh, it's amazing how well he plays with his eyes. Can he see? You know, referring to the yes. slanted eyes and um, that kind of prejudice. Yes. How does that make you feel when you see that? I mean, what does that suggest? You know, that's a very interesting uh, comment because it can be positive or negative. There's a part of me that feels that... Um, you know, I'm brown, for example, and it's okay to be called brown. And if you're, you know, um, you are what you are, and it's okay to accept you for that. But it's the negative intonation which can cause prejudice and cause ill feeling. So it's really, you know, how you take it. Sometimes we get too politically correct in, in avoiding things that may be just normal and natural as well. But, of course, the negative part is what you, you want to make sure doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. I mean, as groundbreakers, so. I'm sure you have all encountered that in your respective careers. Corey, can you talk about a little bit of, you know, being an Asian-American uh, chef? He was there, yeah. I heard. <laughs> you were there, right? Well, well, in San I, I, well, I was in New York a couple of times during that yeah. time. And the, the coolest thing about that was seeing kids on the street with Lynn jerseys on. Uh -huh. you know, and kids of all different ethnicities. And I think achieving that kind of success where you kind of break through the boundaries of your ethnicity um, is it, really amazing. I mean, you, you see Spike Lee courtside with a Lynn jersey on. It's he, amazing. It's, yeah, cool. it's pretty cool. But do you think confronting those stereotypical images and some of those negative comments, does that actually push you to work harder? Does it, can it actually be used to drive you to succeed? Um, absolutely. Um, but I think that depends on your personality as well. Um, I think you can get very motivated and there's a lot of pride behind that. And um, some of that is, is very good. Yeah. Um, it can be very positive, but I think you have to be able to internalize that in a certain way. Well, I think it probably takes a strong person, and some of that probably comes from the parenting, right? The grown-ups around you, uh, which kind of brings me to another point that I thought was interesting. Um, another concept that had been floating out there in the past year is that of the tiger mom, right? Uh, <laughs> referring to the strict Asian parenting style, yeah. stereotypically, where you drive your kids hard, um, win at any cost, eyes on the prize, work mm -hmm. hard, maybe yeah. forsaking some fun. Um, what do you think about how Jeremy's story, does that support or negate the concept of tiger parenting? Anyone? 
Wow, that's a tough one. You know, there's, there's definitely a lot of focus on, on the prize, on education, on academics in Asian communities. Um, but Jeremy broke that mold, really, by becoming a star in sports. So it's great to see that you can be an overachiever or a strong candidate on the education front and be a great sports person at the same time mm -hmm. and be well-rounded. So uh, Tiger Mom is a you know, loaded term, and I, I don't know if I completely buy into that, mm -hmm. but I think the well-rounded um, education, the well-rounded student is really the way to go. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, I have rebelled as a kid, and uh, a lot of kids that grew up in Chinatown actually didn't do well in school. We were too busy trying to be like Lynn or trying to make something of ourselves. And uh, one of the things that I remember is um, I was a happy kid, even though I was poor, and most of the kids in Chinatown are. I remember crossing over to North Beach and learning about prejudice because I was tied to a fence and they, uh, they called me Chinaman and, and threw water balloons at me. And that mm. impacted my life, how our, we have to work together you know, to, to cross these new bridges and trailblaze, if you want to call it like that. And I'm proud to be with Anna and Corey, uh, trailblazers. <laughs> and Kristen, you're a trailblazer too, aren't you? Oh my gosh, um, I don't know if I'm deserving of that, but I do believe um, in the Tiger Monk concept, if that means you tell your kids that you believe in them, and that you expect them to strive for excellence because you do believe they can succeed if they do try. Um, so in that case, you know, it's interesting to see how the Jeremy Lin success ties into that discussion. But we have to take a little short break right now. We're going to definitely continue our discussion with our Asian American trailblazers. So please don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to a special edition of Beyond the Headlines, an Asian American roundtable discussion. I'm Kristen Z, in for Cheryl Jennings. All right, we're here with Corey Lee, Anna Sedana, and the Reverend Norman Fong. Thank you for being here. Let's talk a little bit now about your upbringing, about your careers and your passions. And we're going to start with you, uh, Anna. You were born in India. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your path from there to Silicon Valley? Sure. Um, so I was born in India, in uh, New Delhi, and left uh, right after high school, actually decided to get married, and ended up in England, and uh, saw myself through night school over there. Uh, forged a career in high tech, came to the U.S. about 25 years ago, have been here since then, and more recently, about three years ago, I founded a nonprofit called One Million Lights, which is a big passion of mine. And uh, so, you know, kind of circuitous route to, to get to Silicon Valley. I want to hear more about One Million Lights and also the latest One Million Students. Yes. What is the mission? What are you doing with that? So One Million Lights is a global nonprofit uh, organization that focuses on the issues and the ills of kerosene. Our goal is to deliver solar alternatives for lighting to families that around the world Good who live stuff. without electricity. Um, there are 1.3 billion people who live without electricity today and it is, um, it's really critical to have good lighting to be able to study, to be able to increase your income level and have a comfortable life. And uh, so we, we forge ahead to you know, provide that lighting to families who live without electricity around the world. Um, you get donations? We get donations, we get corporate sponsorships, we've had great partnership with Energizer helping us take lights into communities around the world and more recently we've partnered with Sun Power Solar to create a program which is more domestically focused uh, at the moment uh, called One Million Students and our goal is really to learn from our distributions and learn from uh, the uh, communities that we go into with the solar lighting and create education materials for K through 12 classes here, um, create lesson plans that can be incorporated into math and science curriculum yeah. so that we can inspire our own community, our own youth and children to think global, think about these critical issues of energy and, and, and get creative in the way they uh, absorb and learn these things. All right, now, Norman, you grew up, you were born in Chinatown, right? You grew I'm, up here. Yeah, I'm from Chinatown, uh, <laughs> San Francisco, so nothing big. I chose my life to, to stay in the community all my life, past 33 years, because of, of what my parents went through and what the community has gone through. I think uh, um, 
the Mother's Day was recent, and I, I thought of my mom, and I remember the first time she asked me for help, she goes, what's this notice? Mm -hmm. And it was an eviction notice. Mm. So we had one month to move, and we were on the verge of homeless, not knowing where to go. So because of her in that moment, and also I'm a Presbyterian minister, because my church fought for housing for Chinatown, the first redevelopment housing project. Combined the two together, and my passion is Chinatown CDC. I get to build housing mm -hmm. with 2,000 low-income affordable units, and I get to work with especially the families that are squeezed in the closets. Mm -hmm. They're called SROs in Chinatown. We, we have extreme poverty right here in San Francisco. And about, I love the people who help us, yeah. and I love the hope. I love India and, and uh, global issues, and I love people who can cook. Especially, especially when the heat is on, I think it's your turn. Heat is uh, on. Yes, heat is on, Corey. Yeah. Do want to talk about that? You can cook. Um, you were born in South Korea, yes. uh, the son of an engineer. Is that right? Yes. So talk about how you went from that and ending up to leading some of the world's best kitchens. Well, it w <clears throat> being a chef wasn't something I aspired to do when I was young. Um, I kind of fell into it because I started working right after high school, and I worked in a restaurant because almost anyone can get a job in a restaurant. But um, when I when I started to learn about the kitchen and the kitchen culture it was something that really appealed to me. It was a place um, where work ethic was rewarded. Um, it was a very fair environment. Um, there's a deference for experience and authority. Um, but it was also a combination of, of physical dexterity and creativity and artistry. Um, so it was a combination of all those things that really drew me in. Um, but I think being someone who came to the U.S. at an age where I realized I was a little bit different than, than most of the people I interacted with, with. It was a big part of why I chose cooking, because I learned at a, at a very early age that food really is more than just sustenance. Um, it, it's, it's a way to connect with where you're from. Yeah, and you do bring a lot of science into your food as well. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. Right now we're going to take a short little break, though, but we'll be back to continue our discussion uh, with our Asian and Pacific Islander roundtable. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to a special roundtable edition of Beyond the Headlines. We're here with three Asian American trailblazers, Reverend Norman Fong of the Chinatown Community Development Center, Anna Sedana with One Million Lights, and Corey Lee, chef and owner of Restaurant Benu. We do want to com continue that conversation we were having about how you bring science into your cooking. Uh, faux shark fin soup, and I know you're studying physics and nanotechnology relating to food. Fascinating stuff. Tell us about it. Well, I think we have opportunities as chefs now um, that chefs from a previous generation didn't have, and it's to interact with scientists and really work to, to fine-tune things. Um, I think so much about cooking is about folklore and traditions being passed down from one generation to the next. Well, we're at a time when we can kind of break those, um, those falsehoods that are in cooking. And it's, it's great to be able to interact with scientists and food scientists and even physicists um, to improve what we do. Uh, you were talking about how in the kitchen you felt like you were judged on merit, mm -hmm. right? Um, an important concept, I think, for a lot of immigrants, too. Uh, do you feel like, you know, unlike all the reality TV shows we see with all the chefs who are barking out orders, um, that you can <laughs> hold on to your traditional values, uh, be a good person, so to speak, and, and, and still accomplish what you need to do to achieve success? I think um, it, it involves a lot of different kinds of skills. Um, I think what I do and the environment where I work um, it, it, there really is a meritocracy there. Um, so that's something that I really enjoy. All right. Well, meritocracy, um, it all boils down to education. I know that issue is uh, close to the hearts of all three of you. Let's talk about a little bit about this, beginning with you. Um, Anna, where do you think our education system could use strengthening right now in this country? Um, you know, we have a great education system in the U.S. However, I do feel that at times it falls into a rut. And, and, and I think where education could really benefit is to open up the creativity of the students and let the students take more of an active role in what they're doing and what they're studying. What does that mean? Does that mean fewer tests, do you think? Um, not necessarily fewer tests, but letting them design their, their curriculum, for example, or within parameters, obviously, within you know, certain parameters, but letting them take more of an active role, more of a thinking role, more of a creative role. Creative doesn't necessarily mean the arts. It doesn't have to be music and painting and art. It can be creative in, in math and science and all those other 
subjects as well. So getting the kids to be more proactive and more interactive okay. in, in the education system. Norm, are you seeing the opportunities in Chinatown for the urban kids? Yes, in a totally different way. Um, I, was, I started a group called Adopt an Alleyway about 20 years ago. Kids that, you know, grew up in the neighborhood. And I said, what do you want to change in Chinatown? And they came up with the idea of, well, we hate our alleyways. They stink. There's rats and stuff like that. So they came up with a program to improve the alleyways. And actually, Chinatown CDC, where I work with the alleyway kids, drew up a master plan for Chinatown and presented it to the San Francisco Planning Department. They adopted a neighborhood plan. Now, these you feel like they changed the world, okay? That's the good part. And once you get the confidence and pride in the community and where they live, uh, grades get better and, and all that. So I'm, I'm proud of Chinatown youth. Yeah, I mean, and, that's a you know, creative initiative. But that's it, what it, education about, has right? to link to their personal exactly. lives in a real way. It's you know? amazing how much they can achieve if you just give them that, um, that opportunity. Oh, the future looks good to me. Yeah. yeah these, these youth are it. Well, Cora, what is the educational opportunity that you prized most? Um, I think it's opportunity. Um, I think kids should, or children should feel like they have the opportunity for education, which, is, um, which seems obvious, especially in the U.S., but I don't think it is all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think often people, um, especially K through 12, they go through the years, and they're kind of passing the years without really thinking about what they want to achieve and having specific goals for themselves. And especially now, I think that extends into college level, where people go to college as an extension of K through 12, not necessarily to study a, a particular thing they're very interested in or a, to achieve a certain goal. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids do seem to be pursuing that perfect resume, not knowing where their passion truly lies, but just, mm -hmm. I got to check something off here. Exactly, and, right? yeah. exactly. And, and we find, even with One Million Lights, I, I find so many amazing student volunteers who've really gone and done great projects with us and for us um, only because they had this platform and they were empowered to do it um, so it really you know goes a long ways well how do we encourage I guess to borrow an Apple <coughs> slogan how do we encourage kids to think different is it does it come from the family does it come from the community does it come from the schools where do you think the genesis is I mean for um, uh, forget the tiger bombs for me um, we uh, <laughs> We got kids that can't study at home because their home environment mm -hmm. is too small. Mm -hmm. So they can't wait to get out. So um, I, I think um, churches, community-based organizations, a lot of after-school stuff is where a lot can happen more. And then uh, um, I really think that um, the government has messed up by cutting off after-school programs, sports stuff, libraries. I mean, uh, so anyway, but um, I think we can do a lot. Everyone watching can do a lot. Yes. Yeah, and thank yeah. you for doing what you all do. Absolutely. Know? And what's interesting is what you're talking about, what these kids need. Uh, it's the core of what each of you does uh, with housing, lights, nutrition, all things that are critical to a child's ability to succeed in school. All right, we're going to take another little break, but we'll be right back with more of our Asian and Pacific Islander Roundtable. Can you teach me to cook? Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines. We've been talking with three leading Bay Area Asian Americans about issues in our community. And in just the short time we have left, I would love it if each of you could give some advice to maybe kids who are watching, someone with big dreams, how to start that tech company or a restaurant or a charity or some other passion. What do they need to do? Uh, let's start with you, Corey. Well, I think that, uh, especially as, as Asian Americans, it's, it's important to have other Asian American mentors and a sense of community. Um, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that we live in the U.S., and the U.S. is a very diverse country, and we have to be able to um, work closely with people of other ethnicities and coming from other nations. Um, and that's a big part of being successful in any industry. If you're a young person, should you go seek out that mentor? Um, absolutely. I think that relationship is very important. And if you have someone who can mentor you, um, that's, a, that's an experience that can change your life. Right. Can you be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to be hitting you up for uh, cooking lessons yes, for sure. No, what, what do you think? What advice would you give to I, I really love what he touched on. I, I think uh, San Francisco, we take for granted, it's a very diverse city. But behind the scenes, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mentioned uh, when I was a kid that uh, I got beat up by the Italians, and now I get to do it with high schoolers. I got 50 high schoolers volunteering. We put together um, last year the, uh, the first noodle fest and it was north beach restaurants oh. and chinese restaurants chinatown and we're cooking together you know spaghetti versus uh 
chow mein or one ton versus <laughs> like, I mean, but, but the kids loved it. They volunteered and um, put on the street fair. But it was more important that we talk about how we're going to work together in a diverse city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, I think. That's awesome. All right. Anna, what advice do you have, especially for girls, too? Yeah. It's, um, well, I would really say believe in yourself. It is so important to believe in yourself because there will be a lot of naysayers around, and especially mm. older generations. You know, we get jaded. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes when I've had to make hard decisions, I've told myself, okay, I'm 21 again, and how would I make this decision if I were 21 again? And, you know, hands down, it's a different decision. Mm. So I really feel that young people have the energy, they have they the big it. dreams, they need to believe in themselves and forge, forge ahead. All right. Um, I mean, I was going to say, you're a great role model. Oh, some of you be TV anchors. Yes. Some of you be hot scientific chefs. Some of you light up the whole world. And, you know, in San Francisco, we got a, the first Chinese-American mayor mm -hmm. in history. Right. I mean, it's a new day. Come on, folks. It's the future looks good, time, right? Which takes us back right. to Jeremy Lin again. We yes. all hope he'll be healthy and playing. Um, it's incredible the influence he's had from here to Asia, just around the world. Absolutely. You know, people love that to come from behind story that, yes. you know, nobody recruited me. Nobody really wanted me. I got passed around my rookie year, but now I'm, I'm working and living my dream, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate you. you coming, Corey, Anna, and Norman. Um, really fascinating discussion. We also want to thank you, our audience, from watching today, uh, for joining us in this special Asian and Pacific Islander roundtable discussion. Um, again, thank you so much, Corey Lee of Benu, Anna Sedana of One Million Lights, and of course, Norman Fong of the Chinatown CDC for joining us and really inspiring our community. You've done a great job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. All right, discounts at Benu. All right. <laughs> Man, it, yeah, it, let's back up the words with yeah. some discounts. And let us know how we can all help in one million students and one million lives bring into the classroom because kids need to learn about solar energy. And they the do. And, you know, they need more hands-on um, activities. They need a better um, global focus. Thank you so much, Anna. If you want to learn more about the programs, you can go to our website, ABC7 News. I'm Kristen Z. Cheryl, back to you. Thank you, Kristen, and our guests for this special edition of Beyond the Headlines. Information about everything we discussed today is available on our website at abc7news.com slash community. Find us on Facebook at ABC7 Community Affairs. And follow me on Twitter at Cheryl ABC7. I'm Cheryl Jennings. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.